the question is, uh, is it important at all what, was, what the original language of, of Jesus' uh, teaching was? Paul says in um, Philippians, sorry to jump people, but just follow me for a second. In Philippians 3, Paul says, I have left everything behind so that I might know him. Um, his status, you know, family connections maybe, uh, whatever. Uh, his connection with Gamaliel, the great rabbi who was the head of the whole shebang that Paul studied under. Left all that behind that I might know him. And Paul says, at, at, at one point, at some point, we're going to know even as we are known. It's all in that same passage. Um, I uh, have been on a lifelong kind of a passionate search for the real historical Jesus. Um, the one that was the Jesus of bedtime stories and myth and legend never really appealed to me. But the Jesus of the Bible is not that. And the closer, the more I know him, the more I know about him, the, it's like coming to know a person, a best friend, a, 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 a team member, or uh, a spouse, right? The more you know, the, 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 the more you become. You now, like they say, old folks, they start looking like one another. The, the more you become like. Um, it's a part of the process of transformation. And so it's maybe not a huge thing. It's maybe not a gigantic big deal, but it's a little deal. And I'll take every little deal that I can get. So um, uh, there, the popular idea is that uh, Jesus spoke uh, Greek and Aramaic. The evidence, and we discuss this at length when we're riding down the road in the bus, when we have time in the evenings to sit and discuss over dinner and stuff, when we're on site, when we're in the land of Israel, we got two full weeks to unpack this stuff. So what I do in those, at those various points, I just did it to some degree in answer to a question that was a private discussion up here, is that there is a ton of evidence about inscriptions and ancient literature, um, uh, uh, place names, coins, and that sort of Dead Sea Scroll stuff that is pushing us in the direction that Jesus is a native Hebrew speaker. And then there's this clincher, and that is when you can take the Greek of the New Testament that we have have the words of Jesus preserved in, and you have these really interesting little idiomatic expressions like to give a ring on the finger or and he answered and said, which don't show up in, uh, in ancient Aramaic literature, then you go, okay, well, is that stuff in Hebrew literature? And bam, you see it all over the place. So it's, it's, it's also part of loving God with all of our minds. And we can let it go mush, but they're telling us now that one way to fight off Alzheimer's is to use your head, to use your brain. I think it's also the way you survive being a teenager. You don't have to tell anybody, I said that, you know, uh, of, the, of the younger group, but... Yeah, I remember when I was 19, I'm riding down the road and I had this flash, that, uh, this kind of aha moment. I can't wait to stop doing stupid stuff, <laughs> you know? So the Bible says, love God with all of your mind. That's part of the way we worship God, is to study, to learn, to think, um, and to make decisions that make sense and stuff like that. It's one of the ways that we, uh, that we worship God, that we love God. So this is just an opportunity, as far as I'm concerned, an opportunity to worship. Thanks for joining. All right, I told you that we were going to compare the parables of Jesus about fathers with an example from the early rabbis. So this t comes from a Bible interpretation it's like we would call it a commentary. It's called Shira Shirim Rabbah. You don't have to write that or memorize that either. But the comment, the, the reference is to the passage in the Song of Solomon, which we never read, study, you know, preach on, etc. I know. But, O oh my dove that art in the cleft of the rock. This is Song of Solomon 2.14. It was taught in the school of Rabbi Ishmael. So now you are in a Beit Midrash, 
a place of study. There's a rabbi sitting in a chair or on a stone. This is what we hear about in the literature. And he teaches from a seated position. You hear this about Jesus all over the place. Um, you hear it about the rabbis in, in ancient rabbinic or rabbi literature. And so now we're in a school and you have disciples sitting in front of the rabbi. It was taught in the school of Rabbi Ishmael when Israel went forth from Egypt, the Exodus, to, to what can they be compared? Bam! We are in New Testament world right now. Yes, we're reading a passage in the world of the literature of the rabbis, rabbinic literature, but to what may, may it be compared? You're taking a passage of scripture and now you're going to go to what may be it be compared. That's the way that a parable is introduced. And you hear this language in the New Testament. Jesus will say, to what may, be, may we compare the kingdom of heaven and what is it like? That's, and, and it may be compared to a man who had two sons, etc. Right? That's the way, that's an introduction to a parable. Now watch what happens. When the Israelites were in the Exodus, to what may they be compared? It, they may be compared to a dove that was fleeing from a hawk and flew into the cleft of the rock but found a serpent lying there, right? So they got the Red Sea and they got Pharaoh closing in on them, a hawk and a serpent. When it tried to get right in, it couldn't because the serpent was lurking. When it tried to get back, it couldn't because the hawk was hovering outside. So what did the dove do? It began to cry out and beat its wings so that the owner of the coat, that collection of uh, doves, would hear and come to its rescue. That's one of the things that owners do. That's one, things, one of the things that good shepherds do. It, you know, the lost sheep. It's one of the things that God does. Keep watching. This was the position. This is all Shir Shirim Rabbah. This was the position of Israel at the Red Sea. They couldn't go down into the sea because it hadn't been divided yet. They couldn't turn back because Pharaoh and his armies had all drawn near. What did they do? The Bible says in Exodus 14, they always have a Bible verse. Jesus, even if he doesn't specifically quote it, he's always got a Bible verse behind. He says to the people who wanted to stone the woman, quote, caught in adultery. She never really was. It was never proven. I don't know why we still refer to it that way. But anyway, he says, let those who are without sin among you be the first to cast a stone at her. That phrase, be the first to, only shows up one time in the whole Bible. It's in the book of Deuteronomy, and it's referring to um, witnesses who are accusing someone who's accused of a crime. And it says, the hands of the witnesses will be the first to come against the accused. But if those witnesses then identify themselves, that's what Jesus is doing, he's calling the witnesses forward then he can separate them and he can depose each witness separately. If they don't both tell the same story, which they're not going to do because they're going to be false witnesses, then the, according to the book of Deuteronomy, that same passage, those witnesses are put to death and the accused is set free. That's the reason you see, hear the stones dropping in John chapter 8. That's the reason you see the people who had this crowd that had brought that woman, quote, caught in a, the very act, um, why they all leave. And he says to the woman, woman, where are your accusers? She says, there aren't any, Lord. They're all gone. All those rocks, they're all sitting out there as silent witnesses that these people had come and accused her falsely. And that's when Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. So Jesus is not overthrowing the law of Moses as though, well, that part of the Bible is not true anymore. That part of the Bible is not relevant anymore. That's not what Jesus is doing. Jesus is saying, look, if you want to talk Torah, we're going to go by the whole book, even the parts you don't like, even the parts that aren't convenient for your purposes right now. And the stones begin to drop because nobody wants to step forward and own that. Because they know what Jesus is going to do. They know that court was now in session. Real court, not trumped up court. And not, not, the, not lynch mob court. But he was going to do it according to the word of God. And they couldn't handle it. And they bailed. You've seen that happen before, right? It's, if, the, if the 
if the heat's too hot, get out of the... Yeah. They were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And then immediately, they just skipped down about 15 verses. Thus the Lord saved them on that day. So Rabbi Judah said in the name of Rabbi Chama of Kafar Tachumin, this is kind of that, I memorized this from my teacher and I'm going to pass it on. That's what we're getting in our Gospels. Jesus, his disciples, and they're writing and passing it on to you and me. It's that chain of transmission of an authoritative tradition. So he says in the name of Rabbi Chama, it's like a, that's the language of parable. It's a comparison. It's a snapshot of everyday life compared to some spiritual reality. It's like a king who had an only daughter. Now I want you to watch this. That means he's a father, right? If, if you've got a daughter or a son, that makes you a dad. Okay, so now we're talking about father and children just like Jesus was talking about father and children. Okay, so Jesus is doing parable and he's using parable and he, com he introduces parable in the same way that the rabbis are doing and now the content of the parable is going to be much the same that Jesus does. It's about family. It's about God our Father. It's about us, his children. And it has a it's, co it's containing aspects, revealing aspects of this God that we serve this father that we've come to as his sons and daughters. King who, it's like a king who had an only daughter and he desired very much that she should talk to him. They're evidently alienated. You remember that part of the story? Foreign land, far distant land, stayed there for years. Okay. And yet there was this, uh, this father and this daughter are not communicating. They're not connecting. They're, 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 they're not living in a reconciled kind of relationship. She, she wanted, he wanted her to talk to him. So what did he do? He made a proclamation and said, let all the people go out to the arena. Remember that he's a king. And by the way, that's just almost automatic. You know, this is God. This is representing God. Go out to the arena. And when they went there, what did he do? He gave a sign to his servants. We've heard about servants, yes? No about servants, okay. They attacked her as though they were thieves. So she began to cry out, Father, save me. And he said to her, if I had not allowed you that slack in the rope, allowed you to make a mess of your own life, in a sense, allow you to get in trouble, to have need of me, to recognize that you have need of me, you wouldn't have called out, Father, save me. Is that not true of you? That's sure true of me. There's no reason to get saved until you know you're lost. This is what's happening here. So what's happening in Jesus' parables. She began to cry out, Father, save me. And he said to her, if I had done, not done this, you wouldn't have cried out, Father, save me. Okay, we're going to go on to yet another uh, session. And I've got about a half an hour. You going to hang with me on this? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Paul's Damascus Road experience. Yeah, um, we're going to, uh, we're going, no, we're going to 12. We're going to go to 12 and then these guys go eat lunch. All right, so we're looking at a map of the land of Israel. Uh, you're looking here at uh, the, sorry, 
let's do it again. Okay, map of Israel, Dead Sea, Mediterranean coast, Sea of Galilee. Got your bearings? Okay, Paul is going to be raised uh, up at the feet of Gamaliel, trained in the world of teachings of the rabbis, Hebrew Bible, rabbi-disciple relationship and stuff here in Jerusalem. He says it in his own words in the book of Acts. Raised up at the feet of Gamaliel, Acts 26. You know the story of Paul, his conversion. It's told three different places in the book of Acts. You know this, right? It's not just Acts 9. It's told again in chapter 22. And then it's told again in chapter 26. And it's really a cool study to have those either copied and pasted or write them out or something like that in parallel columns so that you see the similarities and differences in each of these accounts. It's not like one of them's wrong and the other one's right. It's, you know, each time you tell a story, you add some little component or whatever, and that really fills the story in. It's pretty cool. So in chapter 26, we find out that this whole story of Paul in, is, is, starts out in the, in the city of Jerusalem. He will eventually go down. Uh, as if he's going to Damascus, he's going to do it this way. Jerusalem, Jericho Road to Jericho. Turn left. There's probably a road sign there. Damascus you know, 155 miles. Maybe it's in Stadia or something like that. Anyway, he goes up the, uh, the lower Jordan Valley. He goes past the Sea of Galilee. No doubt he goes on the western side because he doesn't want to cut through Gentile territory yet. He wants to stay in Jewish territory as much as he can. He goes on up to, we see the word Dan. Are you able to see that there? Okay. All right, then we're going to do it like this. He goes on up to Dan, and then Caesarea Philippi, and then there's this big barrier right here. It's called Mount, um, gosh, I forgot. Yes, Hermon, thank you. Um, Mount Hermon right here, and so you don't go through the mountains, especially if you're going to Damascus, you go around the edge. So let's take another look. And we're going to skip that and that. And we're going to look at uh, we're going to look at the um, at a at the satellite. So again, we're in Jerusalem, down to Jericho. You see it? Up the lower Jordan Valley River, around the west side of the Sea of Galilee, not going in Gentile territory, cuts up the upper Jordan Valley and comes to Caesarea Philippi. And now he's got to get to Damascus. Which direction? How is he going to go? Can you take a long road or the or the short road. You take the high road and I'll take the low road. Anybody? I'll be in Scotland. Yes. I learned that from my dad. He was our radio back in the day. All right? Straight up to Damascus. In this picture, we're standing outside of the restaurant that you're going to have lunch in on your probably second or third day. An, another Drew's restaurant. Awesome spot. And you're seeing part of Mount Hermon in the background. What's on top of that mountain? Exactly. Year round. In the summer and spring it's melting and receding, but part of it's always going to be there. All right? So we are looking at the foot of that, uh, the eastern edge of that mountain range we call Mount Hermon. It's not a single peak, it's a range. And the Damascus Road runs right beside it. You can't get lost. You've got desert on the right, and you've got Mount Hermon on the left, and you just take the easiest route. That's the Damascus Road. You'll see it for yourself when we're there. Here's another picture of the same. And now from the satellite. The Damascus Road, here's Damascus right here, is going to run right up the edge of the mountain range. This way. Here's Damascus from five miles above the Earth's surface. And here you can see the street that is called Straight. All right. Now let's do text. This is uh, Acts chapter 9, but I'm going to be incorporating for the next 25, 24 minutes stuff from Acts 22 and Acts 26. Why? Because that story is told three different times. Question for you real quick. When the Bible repeats itself, what's the reason? It's important. 
He's, the Bible it uses emphasis. You say, well, why is that? Well, whether it's the Greek New Testament or the Hebrew Old Testament, they didn't have italics or 14-point font or underlining or even exclamation points. None of that existed. So one of the ways that ancient literature, Bible included, does emphasis is by changing word order or in this situation, repeating itself. So takeaway point, what is the, what's the importance of Paul's Damascus Road experience? Look through Luke's eyes, look through original reader's eyes, the salvation of Paul. Paul committing his life to the mastery of Jesus and becoming the apostle sent to the Gentiles is going to be, is going to signal what for the church? The history, the life of the early church. This is a major turning point. What would it have been without the rest of the book of Acts, without Paul's missionary journeys, without the good news jumping um, ethnic and religious boundaries, to some degree linguistic boundaries, and jumping over into this Greek world? What would it be like if Peter had never preached to the centurion? Paul had never left Caesarea on the sea and gone out into this broader... No we are downstream from those events, y'all. Who we are, mostly non-Jews. Most of us don't live in Israel, don't speak Hebrew, didn't grow up reading, reciting, memorizing the Hebrew Bible. We probably wouldn't be who we are, where we are, doing what we're doing right now. We're downstream from these events. Luke, the writer of this book, the book of Acts, not just the Gospel of Luke, but volume two, the book of Acts, views this as a major turning point in redemptive history. God redeeming a people from every kindred, every nation, every tongue, and every tribe, so that when the book of Revelation is happening, we're all, regardless of color or family of origin or nationality, we are all glorifying the Lamb together as one. Okay, this Luke saw as a major turning point, so important that he, he chose what he was going to include and not include in the book of Acts, and he chose to tell this story three different times. Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. I know this is a lot of words on one screen, but bear with me. As he journeyed, this is Acts 9, as he journeyed, he was approaching Damascus, meaning he was just about to hit the city limits, right? If I was going home, which I'm going to do on Monday, and I was, I don't know, 10 miles down the road on the highway, and I'm going, well, I'm approaching Springfield. My wife would look at me and go, in your dreams, just wait another five hours, and you can say that legitimately, okay? He's approaching Damascus. This, the language is telling us he's close to the city. And suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. That's all we get in Acts 9. Now jump to Acts 22. A very, as I was approaching Damascus about noontime, a very bright, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me. Look at Acts 26. A light from heaven brighter than the sun shining all around me. So you get different layers of clarity as you look at these three stories. You get this, right? Okay, so that's the point. It's not just, it's, I'm not just Bible nerding up here. Um, why in these three stories is that bright light emphasized? What does it mean? Yeah, well, Paul was blinded for three days and they led him around by the hand and stuff like that. And that's the exciting part. That's the part we tend to focus on. I want to know what the light was. I want to know why it ex it's explained that it was a light that came, that shone from heaven. Very clear. What's light associated with in the Bible? Whether Jesus is being transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration or the light that shone on Moses' face or whatever. What is going on with that light thing? God is, he is doing something special and he is on the scene. 
We've got a word for that. It's been banded around in Pentecostal and charismatic circles for decades and decades. It starts with an SH. It's the same letter in Hebrew. It's shh. You hear, I heard it. Shekinah comes from the root shahan. It's the same word that gives us the word tabernacle or sanctuary in the Old Testament. Exodus 20. And God said to Moses, let them build me a mishkan. Did you hear that word shakan in there? Mishkan. So that I might shakanti. Did you hear it again? Shakan. Shakanti batocham in the midst of them. God's always wanted to dwell in the midst of us. You know that, don't you? He's always wanted to, to have this close, intimate fellowship with his sons and daughters. He loves us that much. He wants fellowship with us. He doesn't need it. He doesn't have to have it, but he wants it. He chooses to engage in it. I appreciate that. Because if he didn't want it, it wouldn't be happening. And when it happens, you felt his presence before. Come on. Sometime back in your life, it might have been this morning, it might have been 20 years ago, you know how special that was? That's available 24-7 to us. Why? Because he now has taken up Shachanti. He has now taken up. We are now the Mishkan. We're now the tabernacle. Don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? We are a dwelling place of God and the Spirit. Ephesians 2 and 1 Peter 2, etc. All right? Here's what the rabbis say. Before the... He's nearing Damascus. Before the land of Israel had been specially chosen, this is from a, a, a text called Mechilta Rabbi Ishmael. You don't have to write that down. Okay, it's in Tractate Pischa, and I give the specific references. I do not do this stuff that people do on Christian TV. Now, back in the ancient times, the rabbis taught, and then they go off and say whatever they want to say. You never see a text quoted. You never see the specific reference given. So you can go and, and you can. It's in English. This is in English. You can check the, the, their work. And I wonder why. Why is it that they, instead of just paraphrasing, why don't they give the body of Christ the benefit of seeing the actual words of that ancient text? And why don't they give the specific reference of this text? What are they afraid of? I think they're afraid of us. But you know what? We're coming on. We're moving past that. We're not going to let people just feed us a fish every day. We're going to learn to catch our own. That's part of what Israel is about. You learn so much background and perspective and context that when, you're, when you open your Bible, that stuff pops. I'm telling you, that stuff jumps off the pages. Come on, guys that have been there before. Is it, it, yeah, it, this, is, this is real. I'm not making this stuff up. And, and if you, if, please, if you don't believe me, that's okay. I don't take that personally. Go find somebody in this congregation that you love, that you know, and ask them. And then you can believe them because they're going to say the same thing. Those words literally jump off the page. And you have got it. You are there. You've been there. You know what's going on in these texts. And you don't have to have somebody to feed you a fish, to dole out the pablum you know, the, in the, at the feeding station every day. You're out there feeding yourself. And you're feeding your kids and grandkids. And you're feeding your coworkers and teammates and stuff like that. And it just keeps on going. Hallelujah. Huh? That's multiplication. And that's, that, that happens in your life. Before the land of Israel was chosen, all the lands were suitable for divine revelation. But after Israel had been chosen, the land of Israel, talking about land, the land of Israel. But, but after Israel had been chosen, all the other lands were eliminated. That means God doesn't reveal his Shekinah anywhere except within the borders of Israel. Now this is what kind of literature? New Testament? Old Testament. Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, uh, um, Homer, ancient Greek literature. What, what is this? This is, we're reading from the writings of the ancient rabbis, okay? That's Paul's world. This is Paul's teaching. This is his uh, uh, tradition that has been handed down to him um, by oral teaching and memorization. 
So Paul knows this stuff. It's not supposed to happen. All the other lands were eliminated. You can learn this from the following, that the Shekinah does not reveal itself. Did you see that word right there? The Shekinah, that's a special um, experience of God's dwelling presence that, 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 you, that, that you experience. It's referred to as, as a manifestation of the Shekinah. We, we use the word in much the same way. You could just sense the Shekinah glory of God coming down in that service or, or as I was riding down the road doing worship music or praying or whatever. You know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, so the Shekinah does not reveal itself outside the land of Israel. This is what Paul believed. That's what's in his head. That's what's in his heart. He's on the way to Damascus to persecute Christians. It said, but Jonah rose to free, flee from the... No, remember that the ancient rabbis always have a text. And they're not just, you know, speaking extemporaneously. They, they have backup. They've got biblical proof. Okay? We can learn this from Jonah who rose to flee from the presence of the Lord at that presence, that Shekinah of the Lord. And Jonah thought, I'll go outside the land. This is a gloss. This is them interpreting Jonah now. I'll go outside the land where the Shekinah can't reveal itself. That way I'll get away from God and I don't have to go and speak to those Gentiles up in Nineveh because I don't want them to repent. I want them to get waxed. I want the, I want the judgment of God to fall on them. They are our enemies. Because since... Since the Gentiles are more inclined to repent, I might be causing Israel to fall into condemnation. So here we have Paul, the rabbi, the student of Gamaliel, the knower of this text from Mechilt and Rabbi Ishmael. God doesn't do special revelations outside the land of Israel. And God specifically chose to wait. Could have done it any time he wanted because he's God. Could have done it in Jerusalem. Could have done it up in the, in the lower Jordan Valley, skirting around the western edge of the Sea of Galilee. He's got all kinds of time to reveal himself to Paul, but he waits days until he gets almost to Damascus. And all of a sudden, a great light from heaven flashed around him. And Paul fell to the ground and he said, What do you want of me, Lord? He knew what this was. Can you imagine the walls that had to be broken down in Paul's life now by God because God had now revealed himself in his Shekinah glory outside the land of Israel. And then what does he do? This same guy he calls to be the apostle to the Gentiles and send him to the ends of the earth. Isn't that cool? Isn't that neat what God has done? So I'm going to skip forward just a little bit for uh, time's sake. Um, and we hear in Acts 9 that Paul is supposed to bear my name before the Gentiles. So what this was was simply a shot over Paul's bow. This was a, this was a, uh, this was a bell, a, a wake-up call. All right, Paul, I need you to learn this as well. I'm bigger than us four and no more. I'm bigger than New Hope. I'm bigger than the temple. I'm bigger than the land of Israel. In fact, I've got sons and daughters or people that are just waiting to be my sons and daughters all over the place. And it's time for them to com be compelled to come in. It's time for them to get, get in on some of this good news. It's time for them to get forgiven. It's time for them to get reconciled and restored and renewed and delivered and to come under the wings of the Shekinah which is a phrase that the rabbis use look at this in Acts 22 you're going to be a witness for him to all men no longer us four no more no longer just Jews and just Jews living in the land of Israel and just Jews who speak and read Hebrew and are able to read the word of God in the original right the only all right and then look in 26 to the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. We get it in all three versions of the story. Acts 9, Acts 22, Acts 26. And then in Paul's own words when he's writing, Romans chapter 11, I am an apostle of the... Yeah, you see, wh where did all this start? 
It started with a revelation outside the borders of Israel of God's Shekinah glory. And God says, nobody, not even you, Saul slash Paul, can put me in a box. And the land of Israel, not big enough. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all of we who dwell therein. And Paul goes, oh yeah, now I know what the psalmist meant when he said that. Cattle on a thousand hills, not just in Israel, it all belongs to him. He created it all. It's all his by right of creation. We get it in 1 Timothy, a teacher of the Gentiles. We get it in Galatians, entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised. And that's got to include women as well. So ladies, you're not left out there. That we might go at the bottom of this passage, that we might go to the Gentiles. So why is this? Is this something that all of a sudden, you know, God's been loving Jews, loving Jews, in covenant relationship, making covenant with Jewish people, King David, Nehemiah, Hezekiah, whoever, and, and that's all he's into? I don't think so. Do you remember when we hear about Abraham being chosen in Genesis 12? It says, all nations are going to be blessed in you. God always planned for this to happen. So we hear it in Genesis. We hear about it in Exodus 19 where God says to, to the people of Israel, not just to the tribe of Levi, all of Israel. This is what it says in Exodus 19.6. And God spoke to Moses saying, say to the people of Israel, you are unto me a kingdom of priests. Well, okay, but now that we're all priests, the whole nation of Israel standing at Mount Sinai, well, who are we priests to? Any ideas? The rest of the world. Yes. And look at the book of Isaiah. Isaiah says in chapter 42, I am Yahweh and I am going to appoint you, it's plural, and it's talking about covenant Israel, as a covenant to the people, a light to the goyim, to the nations. Isaiah 49, 6. It's too small of a thing that you should be my servant and to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. It's too small of a thing for God to just save you. I don't know, okay, that's a big deal to me. But this is God speaking and he speaks big things sometimes. It doesn't stop with you. It doesn't stop with me. It didn't, was not supposed to stop with ancient covenant biblical Israel. It's too small of a thing just to restore, to raise up. I'm also, this is another thing I'm going to do. Here's part B. Here's, here's the second stage of the plan. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation might reach the ends of the earth. That's God's heart. It's not us four no more. He never had that kind of a plan. If you ever thought reading the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, well, I wonder why God just chose them and why it's just all about them. It's all about everybody. To God, every human soul, man, woman, child, makes no difference about race, makes no difference about educational level, makes no difference how much money you make or got in the bank. Every soul is precious in God's sight. Why is that? They're, we're all created in his very image. His heart is to be our father and to have each one of us, and, and I'm not just talking about in this auditorium, I'm talking about out there in Urbandale, I'm talking about out there in Des Moines, I'm talking about out there in the cornfields of Iowa and that highway stretching all the way back five and a half hours to Springfield, Missouri, the other holy city, if you get my drift. Okay? His heart is for everybody between here and there and in all points beyond that his salvation might reach the ends of the earth. And Jesus would have said it like this. You're the light of the world. Remember that light? You are the bearers of that Shekinah, temple of the Holy Spirit. He dwells inside of you. Let your light so shine, light of the world. You are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they see your life, your good deeds. They see you and give glory 
to your Father who is in heaven. That's the call on our lives. It's not just about, this is not just a story about Paul. This is a story about early Christianity. It's a story about dark ages Christianity, what we were supposed to be. It's a story about middle ages Christianity. It's a story about renaissance Christianity. It's a story about us. We are still supposed to be the lights of the world so that the rest of the world gives glory to our Father in he, who is in heaven because of what he's doing inside of it, using you and me. We are the priests. We're that kingdom of priests. 1 Peter 2, 9. But you, plural, and he's talking to the, these are general epistles. You know what general epistles are? They're written to everybody, right? Not just written to Timothy, written to Titus. This is to the body of Christ as a whole or at large. You are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation that you might declare the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his light. There it is again, light. That special dwelling presence of God, revelation of God, Shekinah glory of God that has taken up residence inside of you and me, the temple, the tabernacle. The holy of holies is literally the word that Paul uses in 1 and 2 Corinthians. Don't you know that your bodies are the holy of holies of the Holy Spirit? Let's conclude in prayer, could we? Father, thank you for giving us this opportunity of having another boot camp. Um, some of us, we're bummed because the trip is put off. Others, hey, that's okay. It just gives me more time to save more shekels. Lord, I pray that everybody's heart that you've touched this morning would have been warmed by the, by, by the intense um, heat of your word and that it sears like a hot iron inside of us and that, that it purifies and that it uh, protects and, and, that it, and that it provides for us an equipping to be more effective as your priests, as your light bearers as your temples walking around Urbandale day to day. I pray, Lord, that those that, who, whose hearts have stirred them, that you give them the wherewithal, the ability, the details, the logistics, the time off from work, the, you know, somebody that can take care of kids or grandkids, the, 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 the monetary ability to take part in a trip like we're talking about. And for those, I pray that whatever is instilled in them as we study in place, in the original context, in high def and 3D, with the realities of the word right in front of, uh, of them, I pray, Lord, that you do an even deeper equipping and prep preparing to be that kind of light bearer that you've called us to be. And then, Lord, I pray that it impact this church and take it to the next developmental stage in a major, major way, Lord. And then even beyond that, even beyond that, I pray that as Malachi says, that people outside in Urbandale and Des Moines will be, will be saying, great is the Lord even beyond the borders of Israel. And I pray this in the name of your son Jesus. Amen.